Coming up on Chasing the Natty, we've got some news from a couple camps around the country, but things haven't fully kicked off yet, so we reached out to you guys for questions you all have for CFF at this point in the offseason in our first mailbag of 2024. We'll be hitting on all sorts of topics, from teams adjusting to the SEC, to Maction Sleepers, to even military academies? We've got all of that and more coming right after this. to go, breaks a tackle, he's 10, he's touchdown! Cook's going to throw the deep ball, and Burton cut the defense, touchdown Luther Burton! Milrow going to run it again, got a lane, kicked in the turbo, Milrow, goodbye, touchdown battle! This is Chasing the Natty, a college fantasy football podcast. All right, welcome in everyone. This is Jared Palmgren, host of the Chasing the Natty podcast. I hope you guys are having a wonderful ride to your work on this Monday morning. We are the College Fantasy Podcast on the Campus of Canton Podcast Network. You can find us on all of your podcast feeds and on YouTube every Monday morning during the offseason at 6 a.m. sharp. If you want to support the great work we're doing here, head on over to campusofcanton.com and subscribe there with one of our sensational tiers. You'll find everything you need for your CFF, Devi, C2C, IDP, betting needs, pretty much whatever you want to play for college football. We have rankings, articles, tools, and even more than that. You can also find me in the show on Twitter. I'm at CFF underscore Jared, and the show is at Chasing the Natty. And the very handsome dad of the year over there to my right is Mr. Nate Marquise at CFF Nate on Twitter. Nate? I know how you're doing tonight, but I, let the audience know. How are you doing tonight, man? <laughs> it's uh, it's dicey times here at, at the uh, Marquise household. Um, number one, I'm I'm trying to watch some of the March Madness stuff to find out if my Sooners are actually going to make the tournament because they're currently sitting on the bubble. So if you see my eyes wander, it's because I'm trying to find out if North Carolina is actually going to end this North Carolina State uh hopes of their tournament uh because that will burst oklahoma's bubble potentially but um no you uh you, <laughs> you definitely hit on the big issue that i'm having here and that is uh, as i told you before the show my daughter has has uh struggled for the last 24 hours here my uh, my wife is out of town we have clearly defined roles and uh, she is you know, the the caretaker, the if my daughter's sick, um, I, I, I take care of you type thing. She takes care of the medicine, the linens and all that. And last night, man, my, my daughter had a night. She she threw up once and I came in there at midnight, took care of that, changed the sheets, everything. And then um, she then puked again. I'm like, crap, I'm really running out of linens here. I didn't even know where they were. Lo- I didn't even know where they were located in the house. <laughs> I'm oh scrambling goodness. trying to find the medicine. Uh, and then this morning she felt like she was doing okay. So, and I told her the day before, I'm like, all right, uh, if, you know, we'll go to the zoo tomorrow. Dad's going to, you know, ah, I'm going to be dad of the year. I'm going to take you to the zoo. You know, we're going to have a great time while mom's out of town in the morning. She looked like she was doing fine. And I'll be damned if we weren't waiting in line to get in the aquarium at the zoo. And she just spewed everywhere. No. <laughs> so, um, if any uh, Kansas City Zoo people that also happen to be uh, big CFF fans that are listening to this podcast and you're in line with me, I apologize for that um, display that happened at, at 11 a.m. today <laughs> that you might have witnessed. So sorry about that. But yeah, other than that, we're doing great, man. Uh, things are uh, <laughs> I'm watching the monitor closely to make sure uh, everything goes well tonight. How are you? Of- I mean, of course, like you said, like with with your wife being the one to like really take care of her when she's sick and everything. The, of course, the moment your wife's out of town, that's when your daughter decides to get care, yeah. gets sick because that's how all of this works, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm 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 doing good. Again, you got me recording this at ten o'clock at night, so I'm hyped up on my on my caffeinated tea over here. I don't drink coffee um, or anything like that, but I do I do drink tea. So if I sound like I'm speaking at a million miles per hour at any point tonight. Y'all, 
and I start tripping over my words, and that is exactly why. And you can blame Nate for that one. <laughs> so <laughs> we got a great show ahead. Uh, we're going to talk some spring news. Um, I don't know about you, Nate, but I feel like spring news is getting hard to come by this year. I don't know if it's – maybe I'm doing search terms wrong on Google and on Twitter and everything like that, but I feel like there just hasn't been a ton put out there. Uh, again, when I when I do Google, I'll search up like spring notes, and they send me to like spring notes from 2023, and I'm like, no, give me the most recent stuff, and it's just like, how about 2022 instead? I'm like, please, no, stop it. <laughs> um, so, but it feels like there hasn't been a ton of news out there, and so once I kind of realized that, I'm like, oh, I can't really put a whole show together with just what we have right now. We could, I mean, I you guys know me, I'm long winded as hell. Um, but I'm like, you know, let's let's reach out to everybody. It's it's a bit of a downtime right now. We kind of discussed this on our recent Defending the Natty episode, where there's a lot of downtime right now. There's us just kind of figuring out what do we still need to find out and everything. So I figured I'd reach out to you guys. What are you guys out there wor- worried about? What are you guys wondering about? What are you having trouble figuring out some information on? I'll fi- I figured we could be here to help. And I pitched the idea to the CFF group chat, and I was like, hey, who wants to do a mailbag? And Nate, you hopped right onto it. You're like, hey, I, I love answering these kind of questions. So, Yeah, I was like, great. Uh, wife's out of town. I got nothing to do. This is going to be awesome. Uh, little did I know that <laughs> things may not go as as, uh, as well as planned, but I love the questions that we got tonight. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And it's been, I don't know, it's been a minute since I've been on Chasing the Natty. You know, we're we're doing defending the natty but now uh just talking about actual you know redraft this is what we need for this particular moment in uh, in information uh, i'm really looking forward to discussing some of these some of these things the questions are great i will say a little peek behind the curtain for everybody it is funny with nate and i doing defending the natty now where i asked him beforehand i'm like hey any other interesting spring camp news that you found out there and everything he sent me like three different storylines that we both agree like yeah save that for the next defending the natty because it's more to deal with some freshmen and stuff like that than anything else so tune in next month for that that stuff but right now like nate said we're switching straight to redraft here and i think we can pretty much get right on into it nate so Let's get started here. A couple of quick announcements, just two, just two this time. Don't worry, I'm not going to give you an eight-minute spiel on how to use the draft predictor tool again for you guys. Um, main one here, uh, the freshman supplemental guide at campuscanton.com. If you're part of a CFF Dynasty, if you're part of a C2C League, that is pretty much the holy bible when it comes to learning about these brand new freshmen and guys that are available in a ton of those leagues right now, so... Go check it out. I believe it's over 200 pages worth of content. Great, great stuff there. It's pretty much where I start my freshman research every single year just to get a feel of the different player pool. And quite frankly, y'all, again, I wish I wish I had some stats to back this up, but I know for a fact it's true. When it comes to CFF um, performance and you know later Devi performance, these freshman guys have been, been performing better than even on threes rankings, two, four, sevens rankings. I'm not kidding when I say that. We have been on absolute fire. Guys like Damian Martinez, Ashton GNT, those guys were way down the ranks on 247. We have been on them since the beginning here at this company. So if you want guys like that, go check out the Freshman Supplemental Guide. The other announcement here, as Nate and I mentioned, the third episode of Defending the Natty is out. We talked some early offseason trading. Nate has been trading up a storm. Uh, I It inspired me to start reaching out to some uh, some of my league mates trying to get some trades done there. So if you're in any of my dynasty leagues right now, I am in a trading mood. So please send me your offers. And then we also uh, roasted my CFF dynasty ranking. So if you want to hear about some rankings that are not available anywhere, that is the place to go. So it was a I fun got, episode. Nate, you got any I, thoughts on it? I got more trades in the works, man. They're they're coming down the line. Um, you know, when the wife gets out of town, what's what do I what do I got to do, man? I'm gonna I'm gonna have a couple beers and think about which players I wanna I wanna acquire and trade. So don't be surprised if more is happening. This is the time of year where it's just fun to play around and make trades, man. Absolutely, like I said, it's a downtime period. There's not nothing really changing. No great news coming out right now. So might as well take advantage of it. All righty. So that's the two major announcements. Let's get into some of this spring news. And there's really no other place to start than an actual spring game. Super early on here. Like some teams have like barely gotten a week into their spring camps. I know Georgia's just got done with their first week. 
And Bazoo's out here already got their spring game on. It, it was on ESPN Plus. Uh, Nate, uh, you caught a little bit of it today. I caught a little bit of it here and there. And it was a low scoring game, finished 10 to 9 for the most part. It was, um, again, good on good. The, uh, a lot of the starters were out by the second half and stuff like that. And it was, I believe, uh, God, what do they call it? It's a uh, thud tackling. So, like, the moment that you touch, a, you touch the running back, they blow the play dead. It was a little hard to really gauge some of the physicality of Mizzou with this game, for sure. But at the same time, definitely some interesting things here, Nate. So, what did you catch out of this game? So, so I kind of tuned in midway through the game and, and just caught maybe 15, 20 minutes of it or so. But it it seemed like maybe they'd... Did they break up the rosters for this thing? Because I noticed that Cook wasn't throwing to Theo Weiss. Uh, it was actually Brown, the backup quarterback, that was throwing to Theo Weiss. So I was like, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's not ones versus twos type scenario. Do you know? I do not know exactly how they broke okay. it down. But obviously, like you said, if if the if Theo Weiss was on the other team, you have to imagine that was probably yeah. maybe like a schoolyard pick them, like yeah. two captains, stuff like that. Yeah, actually, I, I'm pretty sure that it was because I remember reading after the game that uh, Drinkwitz is like, okay, I like the team that uh, I think we have better pieces on the team that Cook isn't on, but there's such a big discrepancy in quarterback yeah. play right now for us that Cook's team is probably going to win, which is actually what happened. But um, no, I mean, my big takeaway was that Manning, the wide receiver that was a he, he was a true freshman last year, I believe he redshirted. Uh, had a really nice game. He had four catches, I believe 71 yards and a touchdown. He caught the the touchdown pass from Cook. The only other touchdown in the whole scrimmage, I believe, was a, a trick play uh, yes. with Theo Weiss. Maybe did he throw the touchdown pass? Yeah, Weiss threw the tu- uh, got a backwards pass. He threw the touchdown over to Mookie Cooper. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that that was really my biggest takeaway. I mean, they, they you know, like any spring game where you have a stud uh, that's that's a proven commodity, they took Luther Burden out after, I think, two series. Um, they're, they're super depleted at quarterback behind uh, Brady Cook. So yes. it was just kind of one of those deals where you, I don't know there's too much to take out of it. Did you gather anything from the running back situation? I did. Uh, I do want to touch on the quarterbacks real quick. I think it's just something I want to throw out there to people moving forward is Bud Elliott, when he does his summer school series, part, one of the things he asks all the time is like, what's the biggest drop off from the starters to the backups at different yeah. position groups so that he can better understand for betting purposes. If somebody were to go down, like how much does that impact the team? He obviously takes out quarterback because a lot of teams will say quarterback, but I think for CFF purposes, we do need to keep an eye on teams like Mizzou here, right? Where if Brady Cook goes down at any point, like they just brought in Drew Pine, even with Drew Pine, yeah. that's a pretty substantial drop from QB one to QB two. And if you're like if you're playing in CFF, that you got to keep that in mind because that could either make the entire offense go to crap, it could be a big boost for the running backs. But you got to keep these in the, kind of in the back of your mind, um, so that when things in the season occur, because injuries will occur, you know, just something to keep an eye on. Um, now for the running backs, again, it was hard to really judge without any kind of real live tackling here. As I mentioned, they were doing thud tackling. Nate Noel, from what I was able to gather from Eli Hoff at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, said that Nate Noel looked twitchier, uh, was able to get downfield a little bit easier, but he looked better because of the style of the game versus like, you know, Marcus Carroll, very much more of that, you know, between the tackles break through some guys the moment he hits somebody they blow the play dead so you couldn't really see his strengths play out in this game mode but so from what i'm gathering though carol and noel are the top two backs and i don't think we're going to be again we're going to discuss this a little bit later but i don't think we're going to see either of them start the year as a clear rb1 like these will be the top two guys and the main takeaway, really, because they're the top two guys, to me, was that Tavoris Jones and Jamal Roberts, especially Jamal Roberts, a guy that they were raving about last year, they got very little touches in this spring game. So I think if you're wor- if you're worried about those two guys kind of impacting the rotation of Carroll and Noel, I think you can worry a little bit less about that. But it also kind of confirmed to me that Carroll 
neither Carol nor Noel have really broken away and are ready to get that Cody Schrader level of carry here. So that's kind of my yeah. takeaways. Yeah, I think that's absolutely fair. And and nobody expected Schrader. I mean, we you and I both tweeted about how we we had read that the the running backs coach Curtis Looper thought that he was going to be a one thousand yard running back, which yep. he absolutely was. Uh, but I mean, I don't think anybody expected him to be challenging for running back of the year, SEC first team, no. all you know, all first team. So um, yeah, I, I do think this is probably a situation where they play it out for a couple games and then like always with that staff, Eli Drinkowitz and and Kirby, I mean, they will settle on one guy and and we'll we'll have to see what happens. Like you mentioned, it, this isn't a great setup for Carroll. He's 20 pounds heavier than Noel, mm -hmm. uh, who's 190. Carroll's like, I think, around 210. So, you know, this is this is not the perfect setup for a guy that like, likes to be a little bit more physical and break tackles. So it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out the first couple of weeks. Yeah. Again, to me, the main takeaway is that we can't tell between Carroll and Noel, but those two are clearly the top two guys here. Who they had on the roster was not enough for the coaching staff. So, all right. Let's talk real quick about Fresno State. Go down to the G5 here. A little note that our good friend Nicholas Ian Allen was able to pick up from one of their beat writers, which, by the way, I meant to write a note here in my script, but this reminded me to say it. Um, go check out the Good Morning College Football show on the Campus of Canton YouTube page. Nicholas Ian Allen has been doing that. I believe he's doing it three times a week now, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And it's basically a cheat sheet, y'all. He just basically... He, this dude does probably more research than anybody in the college football world let alone the cff world here and those shows he'll just sit there and spell out to you all the interesting things that he finds and so to me easy easy show to go listen to three times a week if you want to find really good information one of the really good pieces of information that he was able to find over the last couple of weeks was what's going on at fresno state and their wide receiver situation they lose quite a bit from last year they lose eric brooks they lose, um, oh my goodness, what, who's the other wide receiver they had? Jalen Gill? Gill, yes. Yeah, Jalen yeah. Gill. They lose Jalen Gill as well. And Jalen Moss was the wide receiver I was most interested in coming back. But I knew that between Moss and Magdalena, there were some questions about who was going to move to the outside, who was going to stay in that slot position. If you know anything about uh, Ted Ledford, and this offense the last couple of years, the slot position is not a guaranteed hit, but it is the place you want to invest in this Fresno State offense if you want to take a shot on a guy with upside. Think guys like Jalen Moreno Cropper. Um, think, um, was it Eric Brooks was in the slot a little bit last year as well, right? Yes, he so, was. To start the year. So think guys like that. Jalen Moss. From what we are gathering, he will be getting the slot duties for Fresno State moving forward. And quite frankly, he is going quite late in drafts. Let me see if I can find him real quick in our ADP. Yeah, he's currently going as wide receiver 82, which puts him at the middle to late 17th round in drafts yep. right now. So, Not free, but close to it. Yep, not free, but close to it. Very much easily you can get him as your wide receiver six or seven on your team right now. So, Nate, you got any thoughts on this? Yeah, I love it. Um, I was I was actually just looking at Fresno State's PFF situation, and it was Eric Brooks that played 88% uh, from the slot while Jalen Moss played 23% from the slot. So this is a little bit of a change for him, but it Perfect. it it looks like they're like, yeah, this is this is somebody we want on the field with some of these other guys like Magdalena and, and Josiah Freeman and stuff like that. So I think it's it's a it's a good situation for Jalen Moss. It's a good situation for Mikey Keene, who's now got his three best wide receivers. Uh, the staff's making an effort to put all three of them on the field. So I, I like this situation a lot. And Jalen Moss, uh, you know, props to Brandon Sanders. He he was somebody we, uh, when he had me on uh, his podcast, when Jalen Moss hadn't even stepped onto the field at Fresno State, he was somebody he wanted to highlight as like big fish, small pond. And yep. uh, sure enough, he has he has certainly become that kind of player for them. So I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what 24, 2024 holds for Jalen Moss. I think he'll be somebody who rises in ADP pretty big time over the next, especially if we get a Fresno State spring spring game, and he scores a touchdown or two in there, multiple or you know, anywhere from 
seven to eight targets just in the spring game, yeah. he'll shoot up pretty quickly. Agreed. All right, let's look at, let's go from one side of the country back to the other. Let's head over to Virginia where we're going to take a look at the Liberty Flames here. <clears throat> I love this story because this is breaking news from the CFF community. Uh, Got to give props to the duo over at the G55, Justice and Luke over there. They have been putting out a great series called the G55 Worker B Series. They are going around and interviewing G5 beat writers and really kind of asking the questions that we really want to ask these guys uh, to find out more information about these schools that we never really get good information out of. And in their latest interview with John Manson, the writer over at a sea of red, a Liberty beat writer um, website, they got a very interesting nugget that I think a lot of people be very interested in where John Manson mentioned that the staff at Liberty wants to get Quentin Cooley less touches this year, not because he's bad, not because they were disappointed with what he did last year, but the amount of workload that he was getting was just straight up unsustainable. And at times he was really their only option out of the backfield is either him run it or Caden Salter run it. And so they're making an effort to try to build up the guys behind Cooley to make sure that Cooley doesn't get that insane volume he was getting at times last year. But what does that mean for us in the CFF world? Because a lot of people, myself included, have been drafting Cooley thinking that, oh, he's been a great value that falls into the third, fourth round a lot of times, and he's a great third or second or third option at running back. Currently, he's going as a wide or running back 14 in drafts, like right there in the middle of the third round. Uh, he's come up a little bit. But with this news, Nate, do you think he drops a little bit? Or do you think this is something that people are going to kind of brush off and regardless, they're going to draft him in the same way? Well, I think he drops now. Uh, this is two straight podcasts where uh, actually three, if you count uh, the fact that we discussed him on defending the Natty, whenever I brought up the fact uh, that I was like, man, you sure are a lot higher on Quentin Cooley than I am. I think you had him as like your RB 11 or something like that in dynasty. That is true. Uh, and I was like, I just, I don't, I don't see this staff kind of giving him the same workload we had the von blue you know i mean people were just raving about how good von blue looked in the spring practices last year and then he got hurt didn't wasn't able to be as as much of a factor as we thought he might be uh for liberty last year he's going to be back i know that they've they've got some other options so yeah i mean this is a situation where i think that maybe we were just out a little over our skis Mm -hmm. early on with him and I, I think he probably settles at least a round or two uh, back from where he's currently going which which is probably about right yeah and i think even if you want to take that risk if he falls into a range where if you're going rb heavy strategy early on you grab him as your third running back you're gonna feel super great about that regardless if he does oh, take yeah. a step back yeah yeah i mean this is this is a guy similar similar to how i feel with Taj brooks where i think he he kind of played at his ceiling last year, mm -hmm. but if the staff is is dealt a hand where they have to, you know, kind of give him that workload again, they've shown they're not hesitant. They won't hesitate to do it, and uh, they trust that guy. So, yeah, if you draft him as your RB three, then you're probably sitting pretty because there's a scenario that plays out where he goes for twelve hundred yards and fifteen touchdowns, similar like he did last year. For sure, especially if they want to hold Salter back a little bit this time around. So Yeah, yeah. All right, let's keep moving here. Let's talk about San Diego State. Again, we got a lot of interesting schools here. I'm not just talking about the big boys this week. Um, very interesting nugget that we were able to pick up from the San Diego State beat right here where the staff was actually pretty open about the fact that they built themselves out an initial depth chart which they fully admit is mostly for just determining who goes first in certain drills and everything like that. And they were very clear about the fact that this is not set in stone. This can change easily throughout the spring and the fall. I agree. Like, just like with every other school out there, when you see all these reports about like Devin Brown starting or getting the first reps over Will Howard or Austin Novosad getting the first reps over Dylan Gabriel. Like clearly some of these things are going to change, but I still think that it is interesting to note who 
this staff initially goes with based on just what they're familiar with already, right? Because in a lot of those other scenarios, like Will Howard being behind Devin Brown, uh, Dylan Gabriel being behind Austin Novosad, the staff is being very clear about the fact that, okay, the guys we had here already should go first. That way the transfers don't think they're walking into a starting job. That's not the case here at San Diego State. In this starting, this rough initial depth chart here, where they listed quarterback, running back, tight end, and three wide receivers, they have three transfers listed as quote-unquote starters. They have A.J. Duffy, quarterback out of Florida State, transferred to San Diego State. They have him listed as a starter. They have Nate Bennett, the transfer wide receiver from Portland State. And they have wide receiver Deshaun Polk listed as another wide receiver. So three transfers. Already the staff just pencils in as starters here right now, Nate. So I think that's noteworthy that without playing a snap, they automatically think those guys are going to start. And it's even more noteworthy that guys like, in my opinion, Michael Harrison, who we like, Lewis Brown, not listed among these three starters. So Nate, what are your takeaways from this news here? I don't know the situation with Lewis Brown, but I do know that Michael Harrison is not arriving until the summer. So makes sense. Yes, I, that I would guess, make sense. At least <laughs> early on that he's that that they're not considering him a starter quite yet till they get a look at him there on campus. But um no, I mean it's it's very interesting. I mean, this is this is a staff with, with Sean Lewis's coach, who somebody that I had had tweeted out that I think is a wide receiver kingmaker, mm-hmm. uh somebody that just crushes it with cff wide receivers and you could certainly he's right there on the fringe with quarterbacks as well too i know you're super high on aj duffy you like aj duffy i i i haven't seen anything from him which is was what scares me a little bit i just don't know what he is as a player because he just never played at florida state even though i know he was a fairly high recruit um uh, running back, the, the fact that Keenan Kristen is there is very intriguing, but I'm also just wondering where does Marquez Cooper play a role in this? Does he actually transfer there? Yes. Or does he not? If not, then sure, uh, wheels up for, for Kristen in this situation. Um, and then obviously with the wide receivers, like I said, I'm I'm huge on, on Sean Lewis wide receivers. I had to look up Nate Bennett a little bit whenever I saw this because I'm, I'm not familiar with him. But at Portland State, it sounds like he was – he was pretty good, uh, at least early on in his career there, but I could not find anything on what he really did last year in 2023. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know if maybe he was injured or what, but it certainly he's he's on my radar now. That's for sure because he is a uh, he's a boundary wide receiver for Sean Lewis, and that usually uh, has really strong returns for CFF value. And to add on to that, I for now, again, if you're going to invest in a San Diego State wide receiver again, maybe again, maybe Lewis Brown changes things when it come when he comes over. But based on early reports, Nate Bennett is the guy that they're kind of manufacturing touches for. They're getting him involved in the screen game. They're getting him short passes and letting him do the work there. Getting some deep balls thrown on the boundary there. If I'm taking a shot on a wide receiver in this system, he's probably the one I'm going for moving forward, just based on the positive buzz. All of these guys are going for free. It's kind of crazy how late these guys are going for Sean Lewis pieces. Now, granted, like you mentioned, Nate, it's so much unknown here. We don't even know if this system really kicks off in year one. But if I'm going to take a shot, AJ Duffy, Nate Bennett, probably the two guys I'm going after. And I prob- I'm still throwing some shots towards Michael Harrison just because of the familiarity there. I I think you make a great point. I think all of these guys are legitimate, like dart throws and they like the ceiling in which they possess because they are with Sean Lewis in the mountain West is where they could really pay off well for you. I mean, mm-hmm. and it, they're they're all guys that you could get at the end of your drafts and pay next to nothing with huge upside. I'll ask you real quick on the running back situation, Nate, because you said if if Marcus Cooper doesn't transfer there, wheels up for Keenan Kristen. Mm-hmm. This backfield last year was a full committee <clears throat> between Armstead, Kristen, Davis, yep. Sutton, Blake. Every single one of them returned. Not a single one of them transferred out. Not a single one of them graduated. 
does that change your mind a little bit on wheels up for Kristen? Or do you think he fits that back that Sean Lewis would be looking for like a Marquez Cooper? Wheels up was probably the the wrong uh, terminology. maybe, <laughs> uh, Because outside of Marquez Cooper, we aren't really impressed with any running back that no. Sean Lewis has ever coached. So um, may, maybe the, the correct way to phrase it is I'm, Somewhat interested in Keenan Christen, just given this depth chart and wheels up for Marquez Cooper if he shows up at San Diego yes, State. I would agree. And it also helps that Christen is a speed demon. This is, He's a yeah, he really, is. really fast uh, running back. So he does bring that kind of unique skill set to where he may not need a ton of touches in a Sean Lewis system to really be valuable on a week-by-week basis. So. He is an older version of... Um, Dalen, uh, Dalen is Dalen Edwards. What's the Edwards Dylan Edwards? That was at Col- Dylan Edwards that was at Colorado last year. He's kind of yep. he's kind of in that same mold. But did, if you owned Dylan Edwards last year, did you really love the <laughs> return <laughs> no. you got for him outside of what was it, week one or two or whatever? I think it was week up? one where he just yeah. went absolutely nuts, and and everybody was like, ah, I can't wait to get him off of waivers and you and i were like i would say we have both of us were like please no no don't do this to yourselves (laughs) yeah all right let's talk about arkansas now um this is again me kind of looking around just seeing what kind of news i can find here and we are actually able to get some pretty decent stats from arkansas's seven on seven and eleven on eleven drills that they have been performing performing recently none of the individual stat lines to me are super noticeable it's more just kind of the overall um takeaways that i had here one Taylor green like all the quarterbacks obviously got plenty of snaps here but Taylor green's getting about twice as much as the next guy up so it seems like for now green has the lead on this job even over jacoby chris i believe um, Green had about 10 passing attempts to Chris Wells five in pretty much each of these drills. So he's he's getting those additional reps. To me, that would indicate that he's in the lead there. So that if you're drafting Taylor Green as like an upside pick in your CFF drafts, I think that makes you feel a little bit better. The other interesting note here was, again, it's 11 on 11, 7 on 7. They're going to spread the ball around quite a bit. There's no wide receiver there or or tight end that's sitting there getting, I don't know, like seven, eight catches in any of these drills. But Varkis Gums, a transfer tight end from North Texas last year, I think a lot of people kind of forgot about, especially with Luke Haas breaking out last year. He w- looked good from many reports in both the 7-on-7 seven seven and the 11-on-11 11 11 drills. That Now, maybe, again, this is Sam Pittman, Bobby Petrino, training these quarterbacks to look for the tight end options as part of their strength. You got Gums, obviously Luke Haas still out, not participating, but maybe when he comes back, it's just something to keep an eye on. Because if like Luke Haas, his injuries take longer to heal than we anticipate. Gums was a guy that a lot of us were looking at last year for Arkansas before there was some weird stuff that kind of kept him off the field. Well, now he's back, and it seems like bygones are bygones there. You know, if you're looking for a late shot at tight end, I don't think Gums is the worst dart throw in the world. What about you, Nate? What's kind of interesting to you about all this? Well, first of all, I would just like to thank the Arkansas beat writers as well as the Oregon State beat writers for being like two of the programs, especially right now, early on in spring, that have literally like play-by-play of yes. practices, which is just awesome. I know we had that for Notre Dame last year, and we're we're definitely getting it with Arkansas. So, um, I mean, I, I think the big takeaway is, yeah, Taylor Green is is clearly somebody that Sam Pittman and that staff is already kind of anointed as the QB one. There it appears. Everything that I've read, it looks like Malachi Singleton is actually getting the second team reps over oh, wow. Jacoby Criswell, which I didn't is catch really. That. Really fascinating, which actually kind of makes sense um, because Singleton and Green possess a very similar skill set as yes. far as like a, a true dual threat. Chris Well, more of a passer. It would not shock me in the least bit if three weeks from now we hear Jacoby Criswell's name in the transfer portal. I mean, that just that seems almost too obvious um, at this point. 
you, you mentioned the tight end situation, Luke Haas. It, it sounds like it's just an ankle sprain. So I think he's going to be fine and everything I've read, he'll be okay. Gums is somebody that is taking advantage of that opportunity. He's somebody that I expected last year to be better than he was, but uh, he he really got buried on the depth chart. So it is kind of nice to see him him kind of break out. So other than that, not not much more I'm gathering from Arkansas. Uh, it sounds like Jaquin and Jackson and uh, Dominion are kind of splitting time as the RB1. Mm-hmm. Really hard to take too much away from that, but it doesn't sound like they've kind of handed the job to Jackson like they maybe did Green as soon as he kind of walked in the door. So um, just something to keep an eye on. I mean, it's hard, I think, to gather like who's going to be a bell cow from spring practices, right? Sure. Like you're you're not going to you're not going to risk getting the guy that you plan on handing the ball off to 20, 25 times a game, having him get injured in the middle of spring, right? You're going to want to split those carries early on. So I think there's still a chance that either Dubinian or, or Jackson becomes the bell cow, but we're not going to find that out this early on. No doubt. All right, let's move on to Utah. Again, there's no order to these whatsoever. I I, I thought I could, I I was thinking about like jumping around the U S map and like doing transitions like that, but there's no order to this whatsoever. Um, big thing with Utah clearly is the return of Cam Rising and Brant Keithy. They are back. They're fully participating. And quite frankly, they look really, really good by all indications. They should pick up right back up where they were left off two years ago. They've been given plenty of time to heal. Both of them took their medical red shirts, got that one extra year. No rush back. I think that they should pick, again, from all indications, they should pick up right back where they left off. The other interesting thing that I was able to read is that the rising Dorian Singer connection is looking really strong. Obviously, Dorian Singer, a guy that a lot of people expected big things out of at USC last year, kind of got buried there with all the different wide receiver talent there. Transfers again, now ends up here at Utah, where in my opinion, he's probably the clear most talented wide receiver here again money parks is pretty talented in his own right don't get me wrong but like they lose mikey matthews who was a talented freshman that they had come in last year uh they've lost um devon vele as well i think singer could come in and become the wide receiver one pretty easily now with utah and their history how much does that actually matter probably not a ton but i think it's something worth keeping an eye on that if you like singer the talent at arizona and at usc i don't think there's any reason not to expect that he can't be doing something at utah so nate your thoughts on that and also what do you think about the utah running back situation i know you were a big fan of jalen glover um but were you able to gather (laughs) anything there you just had to throw salt in the wound, did you? Sorry. I mean, he's, he <laughs> still could still could be a thing. Okay. Um, let, let, well, let me <laughs> let me touch on uh, Singer first. Um, I kind of like I kind of like Singer in this situation. It, it's definitely going to be the situation where it is the clear wide receiver one at Utah, which is not normally a, a very good wide receiver fantasy option versus USC where he was kind of buried in a mix of, of receiver options, but you know, they throw the ball a lot more and have, you know, have great quarterback play and that type of thing. But I mean, if you take a look at uh, Valet's stats from 2022, he was like a 700 yard five touchdown type guy. So I think Singer's maybe a slightly better receiver than Valet was. So, you know, I mean, I, I don't think it's out of the question that we could see 800, 900 yards, five, six, seven touchdowns. So I, I think that's, I think that's kind of what we could expect there. I mean, it's a really good, it's a really good situation with Cam Rising coming back. So, um, you know, they may air it out a little bit in the, in the big 12 there. I could totally I, see this being a situation where it's Rising's last year it's Keithy's last year. It's probably yeah. Dory Singer's last year. Just let them air it out. Like the, yeah. if the running back room, yeah. especially, is not up to snuff and everything. Like they're like, ah, screw it. We're in the Big Twelve now. Let's just throw it around. Let's do something different. Totally, totally agree. And that goes right into the point of what you're talking about with the running back situation. If you would have asked me two years ago, who is one of the main offensive coordinators that I would invest in for running backs, it would be undoubtedly Andy 
Ludwig. I mean, the guy was just producing running, just incredible running back uh, producers left and right. And the last two years have been an abject disaster uh, for Utah when it comes to CFF terms from the backfield there. So yeah, maybe they do just say, Hey, let's uh, let's let it fly. See what happens. We got rising back. We got some nice receivers. Now we got our, our stud tight end back. I, I, it's too early for me to say what the running back situation is going to be. I have not liked it. I have not liked anything I've seen from Taylor Glover at his time at Utah. I have never missed so bad in what I've seen from freshman tape to player performance in college. The dude's averaging like four yards a carry. It's it's hard to watch. Uh, so I, I'm i not really putting much stock in Jalen Glover. Um, I, I would probably bet on Michael Bernard or um, Mitchell, who's the other running back that's kind of looks like has kind of looked solid so far early on in camp. Those would be my two guys that I would I would invest in. Well, I'll throw one more name out. This is actually the one I would probably invest in if I had to take a shot here. They bring in Anthony Woods. He was a thousand yard running back at the FCS level last year. He's so tiny, though. I think he, he's like 180. Is he 180? OK, yeah, maybe, yeah. That, maybe that hurts him a little bit. I won't lie. They, but, they've said he's going to play a role. That's what they've said. And when they say he's going to play a role, <laughs> that usually means he's not going to play the work out, workhorse role, but he's going to be a, you know, five, six, seven touch kind of guy. So he'll he'll be the Micah Bernard that keeps yeah, everybody else from being he, from being <laughs> the, the workhorse he's back. The, he's the thorn in everybody's side. And he's young too, so he's going to be around there for a, for a couple of years. <laughs> Just when no, we think nobody we're ever leaves Salt Bernard. Lake City, man. Nobody. Cam Rising was young in his sixth year of eligibility. Now, twelve years later, he's still there. Oh Same with Dalton King or with uh, Brant Keithy. <laughs> Jesus, man. All right, let's keep it moving here. Let's go talk Texas Tech. Um, you might be wondering if if you're looking at the title here, why we're wandering into an episode of DTN here real quick, but. I've seen enough people draft Micah Hudson in CFF best balls that I thought this was worth talking about. The big news here is that Micah Hudson will miss spring with a what is described as a arth- arthroscopic surgery or arthroscopic. Nate, you're the you're the physical therapist. You can correct me on that uh, on yeah, his yeah. on his left knee. That's going to keep him out of spring practice now. Very clearly, Micah Hudson, the the, the highest rated recruit that probably texas tech's had in quite frankly maybe generations <laughs> i'd have to go and check that but even still like clearly the pedigree here is insane coach mcguire was very clear but before micah hudson got there that he was going to be an instant impact player even with this news coach mcguire insists that hudson is going to be a contributor and will not be redshirted because um Will not be redshirted this upcoming season. He's going to play more than four games. That's great news if you're wanting to see an instant impact from him. But I think a lot of people are kind of thinking that he'll be this immediate wide receiver one for the Tex- for the Texas Tech Red Raiders. And I think that possibility was there if he got to fully participate in spring. Now I think that possibility takes a pretty big hit there. Especially when... Texas Tech, I think, has a pretty solid group of wide receivers now, right? They got Josh Kelly. They're bringing in from Washington State, a guy very familiar with a Kitley-like system. Dre McCray, we'll talk about this a little bit later with second-year transfer guys. Now that he's had a full year in the system, plays in the slot, that should be pretty impactful there. And then Koi Eakin, a guy that was really on a good streak to start last year before he got hurt. If those are your three guys... I'm not saying Micah Hudson's not going to rotate into that starting three there, but those three guys will be good enough to really keep him, in my opinion, from being a top flight instant wide receiver one for a Zach Kitley system. Do you kind of feel the same way, Nate, or are you a bit higher on Hudson coming back in the fall? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you on that. I I'm not concerned at all about the surgery situation like as far as his ability to play in 2024 it just sounds like it's a it's a cleanup so i'm not worried about that at all however i am worried about the fact that he's not able to get out there and run drills and participate in spring build that rapport with baron morton show the staff you know what he's capable of to build that confidence and work his way into a starting 
a uh, starting wide receiver role. So yeah, I, I'm totally with you. I think the fact that they have Josh Kelly and, and Koi Eakin on the outside there and Trey McRae probably being the guy that mans the slot at Texas Tech, I think that that's makes it a situation where Hudson's probably just more of a rotational piece for 2024, unless he's just freaking unbelievable, which I mean, maybe he is. I mean, there, Texas Tech's definitely never, ever had a five star uh, to his caliber. So but I'm totally with you. I think that we're, we're we're looking at more of a rotational guy than an alpha. I agree with you agreeing with me. So that works out well. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, one last little bit of news. We're not going to really talk too deep about this, but um, Jalen Daniels, quarterback out of Kansas, it is reported that he is still greatly limited in spring practice due to that back injury, continuing to be a thorn in the side there. Um, I kind of mentioned this with Mizzou. I think it's another scenario where if Daniels, if this doesn't go away and he, he becomes another like Cam Rising situation where he like as much as they say he's going to play, he's going to play, just never ends up playing. It's another situation where I think Kansas could really be in trouble if they don't find somebody out of the portal in the spring to provide that solid backup option if Daniels is not ready to go, and that could greatly. Im- Packed a guy like Devin Neal moving forward. So just something to yeah. keep an eye on there. I think that's a great point. I never really thought about that, but if they go get a, a transfer portal guy, that could be a pretty clear sign that either one, they're just, they're not a hundred percent sure that he's, you know, um, somebody that could be counted on or, you know, it's just, it's a good situation for a backup at, at the yeah. very least. I mean, we saw Jason Bean play a lot the last two yeah. years. All right, Nate. Let's move on to our first question here, coming to us from our good buddy and boss, uh, Austin Nace, at, De- at <laughs> Debbie Dietz on Twitter. And he asks a very general question, but I think it's a good one to kind of think about this time of year, especially with spring camps and everything like that. He says, there's so much team-specific information out there. How should someone go about collecting info on their own to make a difference in their leagues. So I'll take this one first here. First and foremost, I will say that Nate and I, it's actually funny that we happen to be doing this uh, mailbag episode about this, because Nate and I, right about a year ago, the first 20 minutes of, let's see, what episode was it? It was 103 of Chasing the 90, so 60 episodes ago. uh, That first 20 minutes of that show is us just discussing our research strategies. And I think a lot of what we discussed there still holds true to this year, that not much has really changed since then. But in terms of what I think has might changed, um, or some things I could reiterate, one, message boards are obviously hit or miss. It is very, you gotta be very careful sometimes when it comes to trusting different message boards and everything. But if you go onto ones that are pretty widely accepted as you know good sources of information find the posters that when everybody or when they speak everybody else kind of shuts up and listens right when they post something even if they're not like a quote vip on the site they're not like a employer of 247 or whoever the message board is run by and everything like that when when they speak everybody else kind of replies to them saying like oh like you got this right before, like I'm listening to you now. Those are usually pretty solid piece of information, like places to go off of. Obviously, again, some hit or miss there. I would point that out. The other thing would be um, making sure you can kind of read between the lines on some practice reports, not just thinking about who is getting mentioned, but also just as importantly, who's not getting mentioned. So I think that... When you are looking at a situation like, um, oh my God, what's a good example? Where, what was a good example where we were like looking for, or like a good example right now, I would say is Florida A&M, right? I'm constantly looking for information on, all right, what are the wide receivers looking like? Like, I want to see who's, who's replacing LeJonte Wester, who's got that slot role and everything. None of the reports so far have mentioned any wide receivers. So that's kind of telling me right now that if, the guy is there on the roster. They have not emerged yet. There is no clear indication as who who's that's going to who that is going to be. So that's another thing I would say. And then the other thing is again I mentioned it last week. 
identifying those known unknowns, knowing what questions still need to be answered and focusing your research on that kind of writing that yourself down a list of like, all right, I still want to know the RB one for Utah, right? Like for an example like that, like I want to see if anybody emerges there and then just every couple of days doing a Google search. All right. What is the, what are the Utah beat reporters saying? Is there any information coming out and kind of focusing your strategy rather than trying to cast a wide net all the time might benefit you, excuse me, benefit you a little bit more. So Nate, comments on that, or do you have other strategies you want to throw out there? Two things that I'll add on top of what you're saying. I like a a lot of what you've mentioned so far. The two things that I really pay attention to is number one, what are teammates saying about a specific player? I agree. Uh, I I like to listen to interviews uh, of players and how practice is going because when they mention another player that makes me that catches my attention that's what got rondell moore at purdue as a true freshman on my radar really early a lot of his teammates were like good lord this rondell moore dude can go uh and the same thing happened with charlie jones um whenever he was at purdue they're like well i mean charlie jones is clearly going to be like one of our top players i kept hearing that kind of over and over i'm like okay why Players don't have as much coach speak uh, filter as coaches do. So when players talk about another guy, that really puts them on my radar. The other thing is, is I like to I like to pay attention to, like we've talked about with Arkansas and Oregon State, what is the depth chart currently playing out? I'm not going to put too much, um, you know, onus on it early on whenever we're three practices in. But when we are getting closer to the spring game, when we're 14 practices in, I'm really concerned about what that depth chart plays out because those are guys after a number of practices that the coaches have said, yeah, these are the guys we want run with our starters. So that's that's a lot of what I will pay attention, pay attention to. So in addition to your talk about, like, what do players say um, in terms of, like, what they're saying during interviews. I also think it's important to note who's being given interviews, yeah, right? That's true. Those that's true. are guys that like coach, like you said, Nate coaches, they have big coach speak filters. They're not going to just let anybody talk to the media, right? They're going to go with guys. They trust guys that they think are bought into their program. And those <clears throat> things tend to translate to on field playing time. Mm -hmm. For an example, this is part of what really put Terrell Vaughn on my radar when he first transferred to Utah State. Most of the time, JUCO transfers don't really end up working out that well when they transfer to a new team. But I kept noticing in the interviews that Terrell Vaughn was one being talked about on the field, but also he was the guy going up to media members after these practices, after the spring game. And I'm like, okay. So not only is he on the field doing work, but the coaching staff has quickly learned to trust this dude. He's going to be impactful moving forward. So I agree with you. That, that is something else to note when you're lo- listening to player interviews. So I guess really the lesson is just seek out player interviews. There's a lot of information you can gather from them. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's move on to our next question here. And it looks like my questions are out of order, Nate. So I'm sorry if you're looking at my uh, show sheet. Just scroll on down a little bit. I think it's the last few questions we're hitting here. Um, This next one comes to us from Brandon Champion, our resident uh, favorite Michigan State beat reporter and everything. So, of course, he asks about uh, the state of Michigan State here. He says, Aiden Childs is still that guy that everybody loved, but now everybody hates him. So what he's referring to, obviously, is that we all raved about Aiden Childs going to Oregon State last year. We liked the setup. We liked the talent. We were a little concerned about the system there. But now he's set to have a starting job, follows his old coach here. So you're thinking, okay, he's familiar with the system. So why is he being drafted as the QB 60? in CFF drafts if we were all ranting and raving about him last year. I don't have much to add here. I really think it's just, it's all the same, right? We love the talent. We like the system all right. I think the big change is that, unfortunately for you, Brandon, uh, Michigan State's still a bit of a tough sell. It's a program that was left in a pretty sorry state by Mel Tucker. Obviously, I trust Jonathan Smith to build a program back up. 
but they're in a tough conference. They're in the Big Ten. It's not an, an easy week by week schedule if you are, quite frankly, behind as a program compared to a lot of the programs you're going up against on a week by week basis. So, as much as I like Childs and I think he'll have some really big weeks, I'm not quite ready to, you know, put him in the upper t- echelon of guys. Now, granted, I have him ranked higher than where he's going in ADP again. QB 60 and ADP, I have him currently as QB 39. So I'm pretty okay with taking him much earlier than he's going, but also a lot of the guys that I like fall later. It's one of those things where, you know, some of the guys I like fall in that same range. I end up taking them, not Childs as much. I said that was going to be a short answer and ended up being a long one. Nate, what are your thoughts? <laughs> Uh, that surprises me that he's going as QB 60. I, I I haven't been in drafts like you have so far. So uh, that surprises me because he's one, a guy that we know is guaranteed to be a starting quarterback. So that's yep. something, right? Um, but he's also a guy that system be damned is a very, very explosive player, um, dual threat, big arm, big legs, so we we know that the ceiling is there. I mean, if you were somebody that's in like an Ohio State system or Lincoln Riley or uh, Kalen DeBoer, like if he played for one of those guys, this is a top 10 quarterback, right? Yep. I mean, that just based off of tools. He was a uh, he was QB five amongst freshmen for me last year. So I loved him. I still like him. I'm guessing what Brandon is talking about when he says, but now everyone hates him, I guess. He's referring to where he's going in drafts yes. um, by hates him because um, I don't I don't I don't think anybody hates him. <laughs> <laughs> he seems like a genuinely nice person. Um, I, I just think it's a situation where nobody loves going from the Pac-12 to the Big Ten. Um, they don't have any wide receiver. I, I can't name you really. Uh, T.J. Sheffield just, just decided say, he, he, he not just to left. transfer there. <laughs> so I can't really name a whole lot of the the wide receiver situation at that uh, that per- particular spot. So I get that, but I do think, like we talked about it on um, defending the Natty, that I do think that Michigan State and Jonathan Smith are going to be forced a little bit to play uphill because they're going to be behind in in the Big Ten now. And there are going to be some opportunities for Aiden Childs to kind of go nuclear, if that's even possible, in the Big Ten to a certain degree. But his ceiling is capped a little bit because he's going to be playing, you know, the likes of Iowa and Minnesota. And God, let's just slow it down and throw a rock fight out here for a Saturday is pretty much the Big Ten situation now. Especially if, as I'm theorizing a little bit, and we'll touch on him a little bit later, Nathan Carter could be a really good piece for that offense if they do need to slow it down. So it could sure. be a guy that they sure. rely on. So, Sure, but I love Aiden Charles. Don't, don't get me oh, wrong. Yeah. Brandon Champion, I love Aiden Charles. And if if he's going as QB 60 in drafts, I will own a lot of Aiden Charles come best ball season for me. I think that's, I think that's right on. Next question here, this one comes to us from Steve, and he simply asks, give me a few, quote, not on my board guys. So uh, the way I interpreted this is that these are guys that no matter how far they fell in the draft, you're not taking them whatsoever. Like these are guys that are going pretty highly in drafts. You just don't want any part of it. I think a good example here is uh, Chris K has said that he is not drafting any Ohio State skill players. He does not want any of Judkins, doesn't want any of Travion Henderson, doesn't want any of Emeka Ibuka because he just doesn't like how Ryan Day deals with injuries and that those guys can lose value very quickly if they get banged up on the wrong day. I, on the other hand... I don't think there's any players really I would ever say are completely off my board, right? Like, you get deep enough in a draft, in any draft... Everyone has a value at some point. I think probably the closest I get are guys that I just won't have any shares of because of where they're going in drafts, probably. I I just like the guys around them much better. Uh, An example here, two quarterbacks, uh, Thomas Castellanos. I just like a lot of the other quarterbacks that go in the same range as him, so I probably won't draft any of him. Preston Stone's another one where... A lot of people are drafting him pretty dang highly. Like, let me see. He is currently going as the quarterback. Where are you, Preston? Okay, he's dropped a little bit. He's at QB 27. But even still, like, around that range, like, 
Riley Leonard, Garrett Nussmeyer. I'll take the shots on those guys probably before I take the shot on Preston Stone. He he was going even higher earlier where he was going around the Jalen Rayner, uh, Joey Aguilar, even Jackson Arnold was in the same range as him at one point. So guys that I just won't own that much of. And then again, the closest I would probably say Jalen Buckley, I will own zero shares of given where he's going right now. And I made that pretty clear on the latest defending the natty episode that I do not yes. trust that offensive coordinator at all. Yep. Uh, Penny Boone, I've made it pretty clear that I don't trust the idea of him becoming the Louisville RB1. So I'm not going to own any of him. And then Donovan Edwards at Michigan. Now, maybe that changes with some good uh, reports down the line. But given the fact that he's not been a great between tackles guy, I'm not going to own any of him. And it's going to take a p- him falling pretty far for me to consider taking him. So, Nate, what are some, who are some off, not on your board guys? Well, um, so I, I kind of took this this question as more like guys that I just absolutely know I won't own. Like, Fair sure, enough. if if everybody falls deep enough to me, then I, then I, I will take them. But guys that I know just based off of where their current ADP is or where I'm hearing they're being drafted, that I know that I'm not even close to the ballpark of them. The quick and easy answer is I thought about this while you were talking and. You and I always talk about it. Georgia wide receivers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. Not on my board. Never yeah. has been, never will be. Uh, but no, the 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 real answer is Haynes King is definitely one. I, I've talked about this. He plays in week zero, Georgia Tech does, which means they have three bye weeks. Yep. Uh, they finish the year with some of the best pass defenses in the entire country. Notre Dame, Virginia Tech, Miami, North Carolina State, Georgia. I mean, his his playoff week schedule is, I think, by week North Carolina State Georgia or North Carolina State by Georgia. One of the it's it's that combination of those three. <laughs> uh, so that that's why I'm I'm totally fading him. Uh, I'm kind of with Chris K on Ohio State, at least from the wide receiver uh, perspective. I'm I'm probably not going to own a Mecca Buka or even Carnell Tate. Um, again, Ryan Day does love to sit players. It's an expanded playoffs. If he loved to sit players when only four teams made mm-hmm. the playoffs, I can't imagine his thoughts on when 12 teams or however many it's going to be uh, make the playoffs the next couple of years. So, and Chip Kelly doesn't really produce a lot of great wide receivers historically. And um, Howard and Brown are both limited passers compared to what Ohio State has had the last few years. So I'm probably not going to, you know, they're not on my board, any Ohio State wide receivers. Um, And then this is kind of the main thing that I want to point out that really fits the answer to the question is any guys that had really mid season soft tissue injuries. Mm -hmm. So guys like cam camper, Andrew Anthony, um, Logan Diggs, who's now Ole Miss. Like those are the types of guys that after what we saw from Utah last year, right. It's Mm -hmm. just, it's really hard to invest in guys that got injured. Even Curtis Rourke who played didn't look like the same player. Those are guys that it's like, man, who it's it's really hard now to trust that we're gonna be um, getting the same player that we think we're getting. There is an incredible article from a Utah beat writer. I need to go find it, where I was doing research on Cam Rising last year, and they did, like they they did it for their readers who were asking like, is Cam Rising gonna be the same after his ACL injury? And they did a whole thing where they analyze NFL fantasy production for quarterbacks after ACL tears and also different positions. I need, I need to post this article again. And they basically pointed out that quarterbacks the year after their ACL injuries, massive step backs two years later, they're good to go. But that first year that it's a massive step back versus wide receivers um, are actually less impacted by ACL tears Hmm. than quarterbacks or even running backs. That's fine. Yes. Send that article to me. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Uh, It's it's a really, really good article. So the only, the only other other name I had somebody we've talked about already, Jalen Daniels. Yeah. Like what back spasms, back spasms keeps you out the whole year. You can have more back spasms like that. That can be a reoccurring thing. So I'm, I'm concerned there. 
All right, let's move on to the next question here. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Austin, and thank you, Brandon, if I did, th did not thank you guys earlier. Let's move on to Clint here. This is a theory that I think a couple of us, uh, really brought up by Nick Allen, uh, but a couple of us have kind of latched on to, and I think it's something we are very much interested in here. Clint Carlson asks, Last year, many transfers in their second year at their new school seemed to have great success. What 23 transfers that may have disappointed last year do you see having CFF relevance in the 2024 season? Nate, you, good sir, jumped the gun and answered this question on Twitter with a host of great names that I was ready to talk about here. <laughs> I I had no idea that this was Clint replying to this uh, to this mailbag question. So I'm totally sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. But you had a you had a great list of names here, Nate. So why don't you list those off and talk about a couple of them there? I just my mind. So uh, Trey Sanders, running back, TCU. Kentrell Bullock running back at uh, South Alabama. Kai Thomas, who actually didn't even play last year, so talk about really disappointing, uh, is now at uh, Kent State. And then some running backs. Jordan Hudson at SMU. Dejon Stribling, who is at Oklahoma State, which we've totally kind of forgotten about. He was really um, injured most of last season, kind of fell through the cracks, I feel like, in draft season now uh, that I think could play a role as that outside um Mike Gundy, wide receiver, that could really impact what's going on with uh, Owens there yep. at Oklahoma State. Uh, Montonia, uh, Montana Lamonia Craig, who's at Arizona, Keegan Johnson, and then somebody we've you've mentioned earlier, Dre McRae over there at Texas Tech, really kind of underachieved what we expected after he transferred in from Austin P. So those are those are some of the guys that came to my mind. Another guy that we mentioned earlier. What about? Uh, Barquez Gums at Barquez Gums over there at Arkansas. We've yeah, kind of touched sure. on that. He's a second year transfer that really uh, kind of shined at North Texas. Of those guys that you listed there, Nate, who would you be most likely? Who do you most likely see yourself drafting in a draft? Mm, um, Jordan Hudson. I think that's the easy answer. Control Bullock, obviously, with his ceiling to be that. Uh, that option for Webb that takes over now this season. But I think Bullock and, and Jordan Hudson being the two easy answers for me there. So let me ask you, Nate, would you be absolutely shocked if I told you that Jordan Hudson's going outside the top 20 rounds in CFF drafts right now? No, no, I wouldn't be shocked. I mean, that's that's kind of the the type of player. Bullock almost didn't fit into this category of Clint's questioning because totally disappointed you have fallen off the mat. Nobody was taking um Bullock last year. No, 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 no. Uh, nobody was taking the gosh, the guy that just transferred to Louisville. We've talked about it, the running back. Penny Boone. It was Penny Boone. Nobody was taking Penny Boone in the first 20 rounds last year because he was so disappointing after we already invested in him the year before. So I think gotcha. Clint's kind of looking at that type of player. Who's the guy that could be like, oh, we wanted him, and then we forgot about him because a year has gone by and they disappointed. So, yeah, I, I it would not shock me at all that Jordan Hudson is not being taken that early. I got a couple, I got five names here I'll list off real quick, uh, two of which are going to make me Chris K's best friend. Um, but we'll get to those at the end. Uh one wide receiver name that I think is interesting is uh, J. Michael Sturdivant over yes. at UCLA. Very Good call. disappointing. Good call. Chip Kelly, like we, you mentioned earlier, Nate, not great at producing CFF wide receivers. New sheriff in town. He's a veteran wide receiver. Ethan Garbers, I could easily see honing in on Sturdivant as his clear top guy. I mean, Kyle Ford, not that he was really solidified as a starter for UCLA, but it's still one less guy to compete for targets with over there at UCLA. Mm -hmm. I could totally see them relying on a guy like that. Um, two running backs I think are interesting. Harrison Whaley at Wyoming. Now, mm -hmm. granted, a lot of he, he had some really good weeks last year, but it was a lot of it was just him getting hurt. He's going pretty late in drafts right now. Let me see if I can find him real quick. Yeah, he's currently he's, going to RB60 in drafts right now. For, he's a forgotten man, that's for sure. And he is like 
again, he's running back 60 in drafts right now. Could easily be a top 24 running back just based off the Wyoming system over there. I touched on it earlier, Nathan Carter at Michigan State. Again, he was a lead running back for them last year. Had some you know, good performances here and there. Had a lot of yards, just very little touchdowns, very little scoring opportunities. I think year two, he's going pretty late in drafts right now. Again, see, again, see if I can find him real quick. Yep, RB68. So guys that are kind of forgotten about could provide some really good value, especially with Jonathan Smith. We love his running backs. So We do, yeah. And then the last two guys here, Ali Jennings at Virginia Tech, 21.7 fantasy points in his first game in half PPR formats, hurt the rest of the season. You got Kyron Jones as a solidified quarterback there, build some chemistry there. Maybe, again, I've, I've taken a couple shots on Lofton in drafts, but maybe you take a, look, a couple more looks at Jennings. Again, he's been an alpha before. Why can't he be an alpha again at Virginia Tech? Seemed like he was the first game. And then the last one, I don't like saying this, but... The way Hugh Freeze is talking about him, I gotta note it, man. Peyton Thorne. Again, year oh, two. My God. two year two <laughs> in Hugh Freeze's system. Hugh Freeze seems interested in him. Can you it, believe Peyton Thorne is still the starting quarterback at all? I cannot believe it, but you know, there are strange things yeah. that happen every year. They play in the SEC. They have a treasure chest of of freaking NIL money, and yet Peyton Thorne is the best they can throw out there as their quarterback. It blows my mind. Clearly, Free sees something in him. Again, I'm not saying I'm loving yeah, no, I the get, idea I of it. Totally get your point. And at the same time, I'm like, holy crap, I can't believe he's a starting quarterback there. Yeah. So, Clint, those are my names right there. I think we provided a pretty good variety of different guys uh, for people to consider there. Let's go ahead and move on to our next question here. Coming to us from Mr. John Ludovina. Pretty much not the opposite kind of question, but going from yeah, who's gonna is, who, yeah. who's gonna do well to who's a huge risk. He's saying, Who do you see having this year's Carson Steele kind of risk? A guy that's being drafted very high, but may not end up even being the starter on his team. To me, I think the easy answer here is Cedric Baxter. A lot of people have kind of identified that risk already. If we knew he'd be the starter, he'd be a first-round draft pick in all CFF drafts. He's fallen into the third round. Jadon Blue's even rising in drafts right now. I've seen him taking as high as like the ninth round in drafts, to which I personally think people are overreacting a little bit. Again, I like Blue. I think he's a talented running back, but he's also 180 pounds. <laughs> So he is a small dude, not really built to be a workhorse back. So, and everybody kept saying that uh, Jonathan Brooks wasn't a very good running back last year until he got the workload, and turns out he's pretty dang good. So, Baxter, I think, is the easy answer here. One I think that is a little bit more under the radar is Jordan James. I like Jordan James as a talent, but yes. no Whittingham returns he was injured last year he was the rb2 on the team two years ago by yeah. only 17 carries behind marquis irving and marquis irving clearly we see now a lot of people are talking about him now as an nfl back obviously the combine didn't go so great but even still like marquis was his own marquis irving was his own monster there whittingham was not that far behind and last year before whittingham got hurt he was running at 7.3 yards a pop before he got injured so I think that him coming back is a bigger detriment to Jordan James and people are kind of letting on, and I don't think Whittingham's going in the top 20 rounds right now. So, Nate, do you have any guys that you kind of see that level of risk, or do you have any comments on Baxter and James? I think I think you made two fantastic calls there. Um, I agree with you with the, the risk of Baxter. Everything that I saw from him last year on the field – kind of worried me a little bit because he did not look like that dynamic of a player. And I really, really like your, your second call there because it's, it, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I, I had a total, I had a total brain fart. Who's your second guy? Jordan James. Jordan James. Jesus. I, <laughs> I, my buddy texts me and he's like, Hey, are you throwing up yet? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to edit this out, but I'm not going to anymore because this is too beautiful. <laughs> My plan for today was to go to the zoo and 
And then afterwards, I was going to go hang out with my buddy who also has two kids that are right around the same age as my daughter. And I was like, hey, man, I got to cancel. Uh, she's been throwing up the last 24 hours. And he just messaged me. He's like, hey, are you throwing up? Are you good? Oh, um, so God. sorry. He messaged me right as you were talking about Jordan James. So, yeah, don't don't worry about editing that out. Um, yes, I <laughs> I 100% agree with you with Jordan James. When I saw you put that on the show sheet, I was like, yeah, that's a really good point because I have started to take note of what Noah, uh, Noah Whittington has done as far as a player. And I was like, gosh, he was really good last year in limited touches. The running back coach at Oregon is the former running back coach at Western Kentucky. We've touched yep. on that before. He likes that guy. I get it. He brought him over with him. Um, to answer John's question here for me, I again, I, I don't know exactly what his ADP is. You can maybe look it up while I'm talking about him. But Penny Boone is somebody that concerns me a little bit. I was trying to think of like guys that fit the Carson Steele role of a transfer that falls into a system that we kind of like, but maybe doesn't end up winning the job. And Penny Boone kind of fits that for me because he transfers in from the Mac. Obviously, he's already been at the P4 level at Maryland, didn't do anything. He's back there with Louisville now. They have Maurice Turner, who's not great. I get it, but he's kind of proven himself a little bit. Some of us kind of like Kewan Brown as a as a player, and then Don Chaney comes over from Miami. Would not shock me if one of those three guys actually ends up winning the job there. Uh, a deeper version of this, the answer to this question for me would be George Petaway transferring over to JMU. Great call. With uh, with AO Adi, uh, I think that's how you pronounce his last name. Uh, they're moving in from North Texas. So two transfers moving in over to JMU. A little concern that maybe 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 George Petaway is just not that good of a running back. And and AO is a guy that has definitely proven that he is a solid running back. So um, that would be my concern there. Did you happen to find the ADP on Penny Boone? Yeah, no, he's uh, currently going RB28 uh, right at okay. the end of the sixth round. So, yeah, not not an early guy, but still a guy, if you're taking somebody in the sixth round, you're like, hey, this is somebody I'm counting on. Mm -hmm. And who knows? Maybe he doesn't win that job. Also, to your point about Addy, I I really underestimated how well he did last year from North he's Texas. A good he's like, a good I, player. I just um, I just assumed again that ah, he's part of a committee back there and everything. But back, look, he had really really solid stats last year, so mm -hmm. I wholeheartedly believe he could take over at James Madison. So, next question here comes to us from Benjamin Jacob. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Clint, as well. Before I keep forgetting to thank you guys, but Benjamin asks. What should we expect from the new SEC schools in terms of CFF efficiency and relevance? Will Texas and Oklahoma be able to provide their usual CFF playmakers against SEC defenses? I could go on my normal, oh, SEC defenses are greater than everybody else <laughs> rant. Uh, I'm not going to do that. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some numbers that I think everybody can kind of objectively agree that they like to make my point here my point here is using uh nick lissy and allen cfb winning edges 2023 team defensive performance metrics where he tries to really kind of put on a similar grade every team out there in terms of you know you can actually quantifiably compare an Oklahoma with a Tulane whose defense was actually better. This is his way of doing it. I trust Nick's numbers. And so I use that here. I compared Oklahoma's schedule last year to this year in terms of the average defensive performance metric that they faced on a week by week basis. In 2023, they went from 83.57 to this year. They'll be facing on average a 84.28. Now, obviously this doesn't account for, Defense, like losses on each defense, stuff like that. I didn't have time to account for all that, but it's a slight uptick, right? Texas, similar thing. 2023, their average defensive performance metric was 84.2. Now this year, their schedule will be an 86.32. So again, a slight uptick. But to me, if you notice, those are very small upticks. Long story short, if you're going to fade either Oklahoma or Texas from their teams in 2023 to this year, I don't think the schedule is the reason to do it. 
I think that if you're worried about Oklahoma, you're more worried about the fact that they're having to replace Dylan Gabriel and all that offensive line. Those are bigger reasons to be concerned about Oklahoma's efficiency this year than the fact they're playing in the SEC. If you're worried about Texas, you're more worried about the fact that they're having to replace um, Xavier Worthy and A.D. Mitchell and maybe Cedric Baxter and Jadon Blue aren't the running backs you want them to be. I'd be more concerned about that than the fact that they're playing in the SEC. So to answer your question, Jacob, no, I don't think that the actual schedule is going to be the reason why either of these teams may not perform to the level they did last year. So that's my spiel. Nate, what do you think? I'm I'm not concerned at all from a fantasy perspective. This is... <sighs> Yes, you have talked about the SEC defense and, and and that type of thing. But for the most part, you've been comparing it to like G5 schools yes. and certain things like that. This is a conference that has been trending as more offensive with each season over the last six, sure. seven, eight years. This isn't the SEC that years ago uh, had LSU and Bama play like a six to three national championship game. Right? Yeah. I mean, Bama and LSU score like crazy now. I mean, Nick Saban... A couple, you know, a handful of years ago, back when he had uh, uh, Tua, was like, "Okay, this is what you want. You want us to go ahead and go up tempo, spread. Are you sure you're ready for this? Because if if this is what you want us to do, we're going to do it and buckle up." And sure enough, I mean, Alabama and LSU now score like crazy, and um, it's just it's a conference with bright offensive minds. Oklahoma and Texas are are no different no different in that sense. So I have confidence that they're going to go in this, this conference and score a ton of points. Um, if this question were about how concerned which should we be about UCLA, USC, Washington, Oregon going into the big 10, then I, I, that does cons- I would agree quite a bit because that is a drastic change in pace of play, style of play, weather, those types of things um, does not concern me at all for Texas and Oklahoma. And for the most part, there are going to be games where Texas and Oklahoma are where their defenses are going to be challenged because they're having to play Ole Miss and Alabama and Georgia and LSU and all these great offenses where they're going to, you you could definitely see some shootouts where maybe, you know, whenever they're they're playing certain teams like Baylor and Houston and UCF or whatever, where at the end, second half, they're just trying to get out of there with the W and kind of shut it down offensively. I think that's an excellent, excellent point about the teams going from the Pac-12 to the Big Ten. You're talking about, again, these are rough numbers, but if I remember correctly, looking into it last year, on average, the Pac-12 defenses with the same metric were in the low 80s versus you would have the Big Ten defenses averaging in the high 80s, maybe even low 90s in terms of their performances. So you're talking about a, a whole 10 points in the defensive metrics change versus Big 12 to SEC here. Based on the numbers we have here, one to two points of difference. So yeah, great point about the Pac-12 to Big Ten teams. All right. Thank you, Ben. Let's move on to Justin Nottingham's question here. Again, uh, another resident Michigan State fan, resident Central Michigan fan. So, of course, he asks us about his team here. What are our thoughts on the Central Michigan quarterback and running back situation going to this season? He also asks, are there any Mac running backs that, quote, give me a warm, fuzzy feeling for the upcoming season? Or start with the CM. Uh, CMU guys here. I'll go through this real quick. I have Bert Emanuel as my QB 41. Clearly a guy that if he hits can be a top 12 CFF QB with his rushing. The issue to me is still the passing. The issue to me is also the fact he got beat out by Jace Bauer last year, considering that Jace Bauer sucks. Um, <laughs> that concerns me quite a bit, but he also stuck around while Bauer uh, got the hell out of there. So you know, that, I'm, I'm a bit back and forth, but that's how I land at QB41, basically. Mary and Luke's, we talked about a little bit on the Defending Natty episode, Nate, yeah. where he had a better finish than I give him credit for. Uh, I currently have him as my RB40, could potentially rise in the next coming weeks, especially, again, maybe if I hear some good things here. He averaged 18.88 fantasy points per game in his last five games. Averaged 20.2 touches per game in that same stretch. 
scored four touchdowns in five games during that stretch. Once he was given the king keys to the kingdom, he was pretty much that Mac running backs that we've been looking for. And I'm really hoping again, Miles Bailey's still there. He was playing. It wasn't like he was injured and Luke's took over from there. Luke's had the like I said, the keys to the kingdom there as in terms of a workhorse running back for the Chippewas. But so I'm hoping he continues that. I like Mary and Luke's quite a bit. In terms of Mac running backs that give me a warm, fuzzy feeling, I'm going to give credit to Volume Pigs here with an article he put out a couple of weeks ago about him catching, because I didn't know, I didn't catch this at all. But Dylan Downing is the former running back out of Purdue. I believe he was RB3 at Purdue last year. I think he was RB2 at one point. He is transferring to Miami of Ohio, which is where Rashad, o, or Rashad Amos performed exceedingly well. For the Red Hawks last year. Now, granted, historically, they have been a team to go full committee. So there's a bit of risk there. But again, another power five um, running back transferring down to the MAC. We've seen that work out for us quite a few times there. I'm willing to take a shot. Again, he's going free in a ton of drafts right now. So that he gives me a, a quote, warm, fuzzy feeling. So, Nate, your thoughts on the Central Michigan guys or and any other MAC running backs that give you a warm, fuzzy feel? Yeah, I'll touch on the MAC running backs first. Um, Kai Thomas, who I've already mentioned uh, there at Kent State. I assume, am I, am I right in assuming that he's basically going free? In draft? I don't think I've drafted. seen him drafted once. Yeah, so, I mean, this is a guy that, that played – uh, a pretty significant role at Minnesota with some of the injuries that they had. He proved that he's a, he's a good player. He's a P4, at least level player that is now in the max. So that's that's somebody that, that has my interest at that level. Um, to touch on Central Michigan and the Chippewas there, um, this will be a great opportunity for me to promote the freshman guide at Campus Canton. So I was actually looking through it the other night uh, just to touch on some quarterbacks that they're – talking about with some of the freshmen and I'll be damned if uh, Jaden Glasser, who is a tier three quarterback for, uh, for that guide. And this is, you know, this is a guide that takes into account NFL upside, obviously uh, tier three quarterback, who is the freshman incoming freshman quarterback there at central Michigan. And this is quote on Glasser from the guide. Glasser is at the top of, of this class regarding pure physical ability. Other than DJ Lagway, no other QB in this class offers as much rushing upside while having high-end ball velocity measurement. That is from directly from the guide. So um, if I am holding on to Bert Emanuel, that would concern me a little bit knowing <laughs> how last season went, right? Am I wrong, mm -hmm. Jared? Yeah. This? <laughs> Uh, and only in CFF can you be like, Hey, I'm really interested in the quarterback that got beat out by Jace Bauer, who's not a good quarterback. Um, so <laughs> that always just fascinates me. But, um, in regards to the running backs, I totally agree in that I, I have overlooked Marion Luke's to my rankings to this, to this point in the season. However, I will say he did that with Jace Bauer as his quarterback not Bert Emanuel, who is somebody he would definitely have to compete with for not only rushing, but goal line touches as well. So slight slight note here, Jace Bauer had 10 rushing touchdowns last year. He did. He Bauer, did, but Bauer he is was not. the no, yeah, Bauer was the ultimate touchdown vulture. So if Marion Lukes can survive him, I think touchdown wise he can survive Bert Emanuel. But to your point, the yardage Definitely would be much higher with Bert Emanuel. Yeah, I just, Bert Emanuel's more of a rushing threat than Jace Bauer is for sure. All righty. Let's move on to our next question here. This one comes to us from Andy Ewald. By the way, thank you, Justin, for your question. Andy asks us to lay out two running back situations, one of which will be pretty quick here because uh, we kind of touched on it earlier when we were talking spring camps. Um, He's asking us, how do you expect the Mizzou and Illinois running back situations to play out in 2024? I'll run through the Mizzou thing again real quick. Doesn't seem like Carroll and Noel has taken the job by the throat. Split backfield to start. Probably end up in a situation last year, like last year, where Schrader and Pete kind of split somewhat to start, and then Schrader kind of took over, ends up performing well, better on the field. Personally, out of those two, I'd still take 
Carroll, but definitely not at his current ADP of RB22, which is in the fifth round. Um, but that's kind of my quick and dirty Mizzou breakdown there. Illinois, as far as for Illinois, really their only two options are Caden Fagan and Josh McCray. Um, Fagan's currently going as the RB56 in drafts. Josh McCray is being undrafted. For good reason, in my opinion, because he hasn't played a healthy season in three years. But also, Caden Fagan got injured in the one year we've gotten so far, so it's a little difficult to say whether or not both of them have injury issues moving forward. Um, but if we get into the spring and Illinois doesn't target another running back for this room in the transfer portal, I'll be pretty wheels up on Caden Fagan moving forward. If they think that they can trust Caden Fagan with the fact that you know they're likely going to see Josh McCray injured again, I'll be pretty in on Fagan. I think at one point I had him ranked in my top 24 RBs for this year. I think I brought him back down a little bit just in case of that possibility of them bringing somebody in through the portal and them going committee again to start the year. Nate, how do you break down this Mizzou and Illinois backfields? Yeah, I don't have a whole lot to add on the Mizzou situation. If you're interested, just go back, listen to what we talked about with the with the spring game from earlier in this podcast. As far as the Illinois situation, I agree with you. I think this is Caden Fagan's job. Uh, if you're counting on Josh McCray to do something, then I, I feel like you haven't been watching college football for the last couple of years. So um, I was blown away by how big Caden Fagan is. He's a I think he's big boy. He's like 6'3", 250, which is just insane to me. <laughs> and he came in as one of those guys kind of like um, – uh, what's the guy that transferred from Ohio State to Kentucky? That's the oh, uh, Trey Onum. Trey Onum, Chip Trey Onum. That is a linebacker slash uh, running back coming out of high school. They weren't sure which position he was going to play, um, but he's he's all in on running back and and he looked solid last year when he's doing it. I do worry when you're six foot three as a running back. I'm sorry, you're going to take a lot of shots oh, yeah. below the belt. Um, that's a that's a lot of length in the legs. So that does worry me a little bit, but again, um, I, I think I would put my, I would push my chips in on him certainly over Josh McCray at this point. Uh, I, I don't know that I would go as high as like RB 25 or 24, like you were talking about earlier. Um, but I think in that kind of 30 to 40 range seems about, seems about right. So basically based on his ADP, you like me are going to own a lot of Kata Fagan in drafts. Cause again, in the last month, he's been going RB fifty two overall, RB fifty six. So a slight yeah. raise. Yeah, yeah. I think that's. I think it's probably a little too low. Yeah. All righty. Thank you, Andy, for your question, man. Let's move on to our next one here from Mr. Ben Wagner. He is asking: Western Kentucky has hired an offensive coordinator that has been an offensive line coach for the last eight seasons. How concerned should we be? Uh, for those of you who don't know, Western Kentucky is now in its fourth offensive coordinator in four years. Uh, Will Friend has been hired as the new offensive coordinator. Drew Hollingshead, who was the offensive coordinator last year, has been demoted to co-offensive coordinator. The play calling ability has been taken away from him. Basically, my deal is I don't think it's fair to judge friend just because he's previously an o-line coach i think there's other reasons to be concerned here uh one it's hard to tell what exactly what he's going to do he hasn't been an offensive coordinator since his colorado state days and even then mike bobo was really the one calling the play so it's hard to kind of gauge what kind of system he's going to run when i first heard he was coming over from mississippi state i'm like oh yeah so he was under mike leash right no he was only there under the one year of zach arnett uh, so you're not looking at a guy here who's like super familiar with the air raid system. So that's certainly concerning. Again, the fact that we're on our fourth offensive coordinator in four years for West Kentucky, the players aren't familiar with one system over multiple years. That's going to lead to problems. It does help that, you know, obviously Tyson Helton is still there. So the air raid schemes are most likely going to continue in w one way, shape or form. But again, there's just so much risk here. But the good news, in my opinion, is that the risk is currently baked into the price of these players, right? 
TJ Finley's being drafted as the QB 30, Caden Veltkamp being drafted as the QB 45. Even if we knew which one of those guys were starting, I doubt they'd be drafted much higher than QB 20, 25. It's a pretty significant drop from where Austin Reed was going last year. And then you look at the receiver options, right? Dalvin Smith, again, drafted as a tight end in most leagues, but if you put him at wide receiver, wide receiver 32, eighth round, Easton Messer, wide receiver 44, 10th, end of the 10th round, both, again, pretty big drops in ADP compared to previous Western Kentucky receivers. So, to me, if you're concerned about the offense, those guys are all going too high. You're not going to own any of them. If you're concerned but you still want to believe in the offense, those guys are coming at pretty decent prices. So, relative to where they're going in drafts, I think you should be less concerned than you would be just in a vacuum. Like if these guys were going at the same range that Austin Reed or like Malachi Corley were going last year, I'd be like, no, I'm not touching that. Totally, but yeah. They've dropped several rounds. These are guys you can get as your third, fourth wide receiver options. Your court, like Finley and Veltkamp, you can get as your third, fourth quarterback options. The quarterback's probably going a little bit too high, but overall, I think they're right about where I'm okay with them. What about you, Nate? Yeah, I mean, this isn't a situation where this isn't the program of Zach Gilly or Arbuckle. Those, those days are those days are gone. You know, I, I, for the most part, I question whether Helton is honestly that good of a coach. I, I think that he was kind of bailed out by his hire of Kitley, um, which led to the hire of Arbuckle, obviously, because those two kind of were a pair at that time. Yep. Outside, outside of that time frame, those two years, he's been pretty mediocre. So this isn't really a a program that I am actively pursuing like I was the last couple of years. Um, and and like you like you pointed out, the the there's also an issue of not just what this offense looks like, but who the hell is going to be the go to guys here? We don't know who the starting quarterback is going to be. We don't know uh, who the main – I mean, we know who the wide receivers are. We don't know really who necessarily the alphas are. I mean, you got Dalvin Smith. you got Michael Matheson coming back from injury. Great you got point. Master, who was there. Um, Keith transfers in from Bowling Green, who is going to battle with um, Young, I believe now, as like the starting running back. So everything just kind of seems like – it's 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 hard to really pinpoint who I really want in this offense. So it makes sense that these guys are going later than they have been. I'm comfortable taking a few shots here and there on guys, but I'm definitely not going to reach on this offense. Yeah, I agree 100%. All right. Move on to our next question. Going back to back to the G5 here. Which is interesting because this question comes to us from Purple Rain at UW Purple Rain, which makes me think that this is about to be a Washington question. But no, he asked about <laughs> Miami of Ohio. He says Miami of Ohio was a offense was a pass happy. Was the offense? Excuse me, was pass happy early last season after the quarterback Brett Gabbert was hurt. They switched to a run happy offense. Have you heard what direction the offense is going in for for 2024? I've not heard anything, but based on the personnel there, I can kind of get a guess of where this is going. So just like Emperor Palpatine in The Rise of Skywalker, Brett Gabbert has somehow returned. Um, I did not know that this man had another year of eligibility, but he is back and he is probably getting ready to cash in his 401k. Um, but him being back is an indication that they're probably going to be more okay with passing the ball again, just like they were to start the year last year, right? So with the QB trust, you're going to lean towards passing early again. Obviously, they lose Gage Larverdame, which is a big loss in that passing game. We'll see who they kind of replace him with. The other part is that Avion Smith, who was the quarterback after Gabbert went down, very limited passer. He's out. He's transferred out. Maddox Cop looks like he's going to be the QB2. He's not good, but he's probably a more competent passer than Avion Smith. And he's yeah. not a he's not a dual threat guy, so he's not gonna take off and run on you. So they're probably gonna try to run similar concepts 
with him that they would with Gabbard rather than reinventing the whole offense around like a guy like Avion Smith's talent. Yeah. The other part of it is, as we mentioned earlier, the Dylan Downing effect, right? They bring him in big fish, small pond from the power four level. So he could get that Rashad Amos role and they just run the ball 20 times with him. Who knows? I'm going to lean towards they, they run with, or they pass the ball with Gabbard again. They seem to trust him really well. That's the way I'm leaning. Nate, do you kind of read it similarly there? I, I totally do. Yeah, Gabbard's come, coming back <laughs> amazingly. <laughs> I love the idea of uh, maybe Miami, Ohio has a great uh, pension uh, for him, given that he's going to retire there. But yeah, this is, Avion Smith totally changes the offense of, of what their system looks like when Gabbard goes down. That's not going to be the case this year. I can see them definitely trying to get back to what he does, and and that's throw the ball around a little bit. Uh, Rashad Amos moves on. They're going to be less dependent potentially on the run. So I yeah, I just all signs point towards health, provided that this this is a little bit more of a pass friendly offense. And we were talking about earlier, right? The question that Austin led us off with about like, what do you? What do you do to kind of get an edge? It goes back to these known unknowns, right? And these yeah. are the ones we're not thinking about. We know Miami of Ohio loves to target one wide receiver, but I can tell you in the 30 round drafts that I've been doing, nobody's taking shots on that position, even though we know that it's going to be productive. What a bummer George Larvidane moved. I know, right? From that offense. What a bummer. Right? It was a huge bummer. And if you just take that extra time, to focus in on this offense that nobody else is talking about right now. Like identify these offenses that it seems like nobody, everybody's kind of overlooking uh, FAU is another good example. Yeah. Take some time to research these guys. That's where you gain your edge. And I'm yeah. specifically saying that at the end of this podcast so that less people hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, we got one more question here and then we can get out of here. Nate, I know we're going a little bit long. Last one here comes to us from Joe. Also, by the way, thank you, Purple Rain. Thank you, Ben Wagner, for your questions. Joe simply says, military schools. Maybe who to target in best balls? Who could be some hidden gems for redrafts? Obviously, we're talking about Air Force, Navy, Army. The triple option teams that make us kind of want to throw up in our mouth a little bit. So I'll start off with that. Most of these guys... I'm not taking a ton of shots on in CFF best balls. I'll be real with you. But Joe, you asked the question. And so I did some research to see if there's anybody that really stands out to me. The clear guy to target, I think, in any of these is the Air Force super back role, right? The Brad Roberts. Last year, the Emmanuel Michels, um, or the Emmanuel Michels, right? When he was healthy, he was incredible for CFF because those are guys that get 30 carries a game. It's not clear right now at Arizona who is getting that super back role. Dylan Carson's the lead returning r- rusher. There's been talk that he's getting some work at the super back position. But the guy that is kind of named by name in reports as the first one for the super back position is Aiden Calvert, a guy who rushed for just a little bit under 200 yards last year for Air Force. It, it, is, it was weirdly phrased because they mentioned him specifically, but then they also say that Dylan Carson and a couple other guys were also getting work at the super back position. So I think they haven't fully decided. Again, another area to focus your research, see if you can find who breaks away from the pack there. Um, in terms of Navy, I might take a shot on Alex, uh, Alex Texa. Again, 128 attempts last year, 758 yards, five touchdowns. He's a good spot start here and there. Maybe if you get him against a good or against a rushing team that, or a team that has a poor rushing defense, I might take my shot there. And then Army, um, it's Bryson Daly would be interesting to me if he was in the same category as like a Zach Larrier last year. Because Zach Larrier also had a running back eligibility, so you could start a rushing quarterback at running back, and basically in a couple of leagues. I would grab both Larrier and Emmanuel Mitchell and start them both and be like, all righty, I'm getting, I'm getting 60 carries between these two guys right here. Um, but Daly doesn't have that. So as much as I like a guy that gets 20 rushing attempts per game 
what good is that when he only averages 11 passing attempts per game? Probably less this year. Now that they moved on from the Kennesaw State offensive coordinator, they're going back to a traditional triple option. I'm not, I'm not dealing with Daly. And then Kadia Udo is also interesting because he got 10 carries a game as a freshman, led the team in carries per game again, as a true freshman. Maybe he builds on that trust into 20 games a carry. Again, I, I get it. It's wishful thinking. But we've seen things like that happen before where systems that don't normally have a bell cow back, when a guy gets carries early on and then as they mature, as they get into become a veteran, they kind of break that mold a little bit as the staff is very trusting of them. So maybe Udo gets a year two bump here. Those are the three. Those are the guys I maybe take a shot on. But for the most part, it's not worth it to me. What about you, Nate? Um, I'm sorry, Joe. I don't have much for you. I don't. Uh, I don't trust any military academies. I haven't drafted a military academy player since the Reynolds and uh, Perry days over at uh, at Navy with their quarterbacks. So uh, listen to what Jared has to say about this and. Go. Go with him on that because it's just not even on my radar. To be honest with you, and I don't think Joe would blame you one bit. But it is—it's an interesting. He seems thing. really excited about him. Yeah. <laughs> All righty, Nate. With that, I do believe we have come to the end of our show. I want to thank everyone out there for listening. If you have not already, go ahead and leave a like, comment, and subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're on the podcast side of things, make sure you follow the show and leave a five-star review where you can. It's been a while since we got one of those, so let me see if one of you out there can be my white knight in shining armor and post a five-star review you put out there on Twitter um, I don't have any prizes for you right now, but maybe I can maybe I can convince the higher ups at C to C to get you a little something. We'll see. No promises. Um, speaking of Campus Kenton, make sure you check out the rest of the Campus Kenton Podcast Network for shows ranging on pretty much anything you can think of related to the college fantasy game. We'll see you guys back here next Monday where we're going to continue to talk about some of these spring camps, and we'll have another fun uh, topic for you guys. On top of that, again, spring games are right around the corner, so that's pretty much going to dominate a good chunk of late March and early April for us. Nate, before we get out of here, you got anything you want to throw out there to people in terms of stuff you're working on or just general pieces of advice? No. Uh, go check out Defending the Natty, man. We, we're we having a fun time with that podcast, so I hope everybody's listening to it. hope everybody's enjoying it, uh, and I hope everybody – didn't really get too disturbed by all the amount of throw up talk that we had about my daughter <laughs> throughout this podcast. But other than that, man, check it out and I uh, hope, hope everybody's having fun. Every person out there who is a parent listening to this podcast <laughs> has never related to you more, Nate. I guarantee you. <laughs> no doubt. There's zero doubt about that. All righty. Well, until next week, y'all really appreciate you guys and I hope you guys have a wonderful and blessed week. See y'all.